يحلون على ورقه ثانيه اسمع سالها لا ياسمين Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. I have the pleasure today to introduce to you the delegation of the U.S. Peace Council, led by my distinguished friend Al, Alfred, and the distinguished members of the uh, delegation. They are here today to brief you on their latest visit to Damascus recently and to Syria. They had a fruitful and successful visit in Syria. I wouldn't elaborate too much on it. The details will come directly from the horse's mouth. They will explain to you what they saw, what they heard, and what they knew. They wanted wholeheartedly to come to the United Nations headquarters in New York to share all this very important information with the reporters and correspondents accredited to the United Nations, because you are the exposure of the genuine information and the accurate information. So without any further delay, I would like to introduce to you the members of the delegation. As I said, the head of the delegation is Al. Next to him, Henry. Next to him, Joe. Then we have Dana. And then we have Madeline. And then Dr. Bahman. I think uh, uh, Al will start, will inaugurate the, the speech. So without any further delay, I give him the floor. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Ambassador. Thank you very, very much. And thank you all for coming to hear our presentation. Uh, I'm Alfred Martyr, and I'm president of the U.S. Peace Council. It was quite evident to us over the several years that what we were hearing and reading from the press was obviously confusing the American people and the peace movement the large vocal anti-war movement that exists in our country. We saw the same pattern of every other invasion, where the leadership of the country was demonized and therefore used as an excuse to intervene in the internal affairs. Our organization, the U.S. Peace Council, is a firm advocate of the United Nations Charter with deep respect for the sovereignty of all countries. Respecting the rights of the peoples of those countries to determine their own destiny. It was our consideration that we had to reach out to the U.S. peace movement and ask that they participate in a delegation to Syria to see for themselves what existed, to speak to both officials and non-officials, civil society, to try to determine for themselves independently the situation in Syria 
and the road to peace. That is our responsibility. Our responsibility is to reach out first to the U.S. peace movement and then to the American people. The campaign to confuse the American people has been intense. And it is our purpose to try to bring some light, some understanding, which can perhaps lead to the American people demanding an end to the intervention and peace in, in, in Syria. We reached out to many organizations, peace organizations in our country to try to get a broad delegation to go. I would be less than honest if I did not say that some did not come because they were fearful of going into a war zone. Others demonstrated the confusion that does exist because of reading the, the propaganda and the barrage of, unfortunately, the media, which gives such a one-sided story. We feel we have that obligation. And it's a tribute to those who went, that they overcame those obstacles and agreed to go. And may I point out, paid their own way to go. So I would like to first introduce the co-leader of the delegation, a member of the Executive Board of the U.S. Peace Council, Dr. Henry Lowendorf. Thank you, Al. Thank you, Ambassador. Our delegation was co-led by Jerry Condon, who's the Vice President of Veterans for Peace. He's not able to be here. He's active uh, right now in Seattle, Washington, where he lives, in that area. Two other members of the delegation are unable to be here. Judy Bellow, who lives in Rochester, and Vanessa Bealey, who is a, an independent journalist who has returned to Syria to report directly uh, what she is seeing as, as uh, she investigates further um, the truth of what's happening in Syria. I think what Alfred said is so true. We are fighting a mass of propaganda that has demonized the Syrian government demonized its leaders, a, an effort that precedes every other intervention that the United States has made over the course of many, many decades in order to convince people that it's okay for quote-unquote humanitarian reasons to overthrow a government and to replace it with whatever. The United States prefers uh, a government that is not independent, that is a willing uh, participant in what the U.S., whatever U.S. policy is. So what we saw in, in Damascus and what we saw in the two villages we visited outside Damascus belies the propaganda that has um, overwhelmed us. It's hard, it, it, it's hard for even those of us who have been in the peace movement for a long time. It's hard for us to ignore this propaganda. It is so uh, well orchestrated. We spoke to, we spoke to uh, members of industry, the Chamber of Industry. We spoke to leaders in the student union, the National Student Union. We spoke with uh, NGOs that are involved in taking care of the orphans of, of those who 
have died in this war on both sides. They don't discriminate. Orphans are orphans. Whatever side they were fighting on, these young people have to be taken care of. We worked with, we, we spoke with an NGO that trains, trains women who don't have a skill in sewing because they lost the breadwinner in their family. We spoke to uh, an NGO where they're trying to, they're trying to uh, deal with reconciliation and trying to make sure that supplies get to those areas of the country that are under the control of the terrorists, the mercenaries. And we make a distinction between opposition, the political opposition with whom we also met, and the terrorists and the mercenaries with whom we did not meet. We met people in Syria who work uh, nonviolently to bring about change. We learned of their efforts to bring about change, working in opposition to the government, working with the government, but nonviolently. We met with government officials. We met with the, the uh, Minister of Administration. We met with the, minister, uh, the Ministry of Health. We met with the, minis with the Minister of Reconciliation. A whole approach, a whole approach to bringing back those Syrians who have, for one reason or another, joined the mercenaries and the terrorists. And my fellow delegates will speak, I think, about some of the details of these. But I want to give you an, just an overview of whom we met with. We saw for ourselves the damage that was done to the university. Even while we were there, a shell fell into the School of Architecture, killing students and faculty. And the students themselves were rebuilding the, the damage. We saw villages that are basically Christian villages that have been besieged by the terrorists but have now been liberated. And the damage done to a shrine in a village called Malula, which is a village where they still speak Aramaic, the language of Jesus, and the attacks on the Christian population. One of the things I bring back, there are two things I want to mention finally that, that we feel are really important. One is that while the United States would like to divide the Syrians up by religion or within a religion by the different beliefs within that religion, there wasn't a Syrian we talked to who would accept that. We spoke to the Grand Mufti and he said, People ask me how many Muslims there are in Syria, and his response is always 23 million. That's the population of Syria. And when we talk to the, the bishop of, the Orthodox, of one of the Orthodox churches, he answered the same thing. The number of Christians is 23 million. We will not allow ourselves to be divided up the way the United States has divided up the people of Iraq or, or Libya or Afghanistan or so many other countries. We won't allow that. And that unity, I believe, has led to the ability of the Syrians to withstand an invasion by the most powerful country in the world and its most powerful allies in Europe, its most powerful allies in the Middle East, with, with what is a vicious attack on the Syrian people. The second is the sanctions. I have to admit that I did not know before I went that the United States has imposed sanctions on Syria in a way that's similar to the sanctions that the United States imposed on Iraq in the 1990s in order to weaken that country and that government that the, the United States admits killed 500,000 children in Iraq during the 1990s sanctions. That sanction, set of sanctions, 
means that the Syrian people cannot get medicines that they desperately need. They cannot get factory parts that they need to maintain their economy. They can't get infant formula and many other things. Their students cannot go abroad. Their lawyers are separated from the rest of the international legal system because of those sanctions. These sanctions are not reported in the U.S. media, to my knowledge, and we need to know about them. Another way to weaken, these sanctions are another way to weaken the Syrian government and the Syrian state. So that's my, that's my overview. I would like to ask my fellow delegates to add what they want to this. We have we, we have representation from different peace organizations uh, and, and peace movements within the United States. We tried to make it as a broad, as, as Al Martyr said, as broad a delegation as we could. So maybe, Madeline, you would like to? Sure. Sorry. Yeah. My name is Madeline Hoffman. I'm the director of New Jersey Peace Action. I went as an individual representing myself, but I've been a peace activist for 16 years. And I went because I felt that, I went to Syria because I felt that it was important to learn from the Syrian people themselves what was actually happening in Syria because there's been, there has not been enough of uh, or a focused enough response by the peace movement in the United States to what's been going on in Syria. And I don't, want, I don't, I can't add a whole lot to what Henry and Al have said, but I want to make this one particular point because I think it's very important and it gets to the core of everything that's going on. This is not a civil war in Syria. That's probably the first thing we heard and we heard it over and over again. It is not President Assad against his own people. It is President Assad and the Syrian people all together in unity against outside forces, outside mercenary forces, terror organizations. Um, and I, the names change every day or every other day to try to protect their identity and maybe keep the connection between the country that funded it and that group kind of a little bit more nebulous, but there are groups, mercenary forces, supported by Qatar, Saudi Arabia, Turkey, the United States, and underneath it, Israel, the state of Israel. Um, and these outside mercenary forces are the ones that are terrorizing the Syrian people and are attempting to divide the Syrian people. Remember, I remember when the U.S. invaded Iraq uh, our organization was against it well before the invasion ever began. But once the invasion were o was over and the United States was setting up a government, we talked to many Iraqis who said, we're not Sunni and Shia, we're not Sunni, Shia, and Kurds, but the United States is trying to divide us that way. And we got exactly the same message when we, are in, when we were in Syria. We are Syrians, as Henry said before, whether you're Christian, Muslim, or other, you're Syrian. And that's one, one of the things that's enabled the Assad government to withstand five plus years of this kind of outside attack. When Saddam Hussein, when it was time for the US to unseat Saddam Hussein, after years of sanctions and two wars, he fell like that. When it was time the United States decided time for Gaddafi to go, he fell like that. But when it was time the United States decided it was time for Assad to go, he did not fall. And why? Because he has the support of 23 million Syrian people, and it was more before all these refugees um, were created and refugees were sent around the world. Um, the whole idea of regime change, the policy of regime change, if you will, it's illegal under international law. The United States has no right to do that. The United States has no right to decide for the Syrian people who their government leaders should be. And so I, during my time there in Syria, I felt that over and over again. Who are we? Why are we presuming to know what's best for the Syrian people? And 
The other part of this that I think people in the United States need to know is that the Assad government provides free health care, free universal health care to everyone. It's, a mission, it's part of the government's mission. Free education for everyone from primary school all the way through even to university and medical school. And we met with one person, when we met with this one particular person from the nonviolent opposition, we asked him, well, tell us, what are some of your um, grievances with the Assad government? And he said, well, you, heard, you just heard that it costs about $50 a year for people going to medical school. We think that's too high. I mean, he was being somewhat facetious, of course, but these are kinds, the kinds of policies that our citizens here in the United States are calling for, tuition-free college, universal health care. So the Assad regime, uh, no, the Assad government, excuse me, is in the business of doing this and providing this to the people, and without a doubt, even the nonviolent opposition parties who had issue with issues of democracy or corruption prior to 2011, Everyone has thrown in, thrown themselves in behind the Assad government because that's the best hope, the best bet for the Syrian people. And um, so lastly, I think I, w I want to echo what Henry said, that to a person, people asked that the sanctions be lifted because those sanctions, while we were there, somebody came and said, a certain pharmaceutical company, which name I forget at the moment, was refusing to send uh, childhood immunizations from the United States to Syria, um, causing great harm to Syrian people. That's not, that's not how this country or any country should act within the world community. Um, so the sanctions, as we've learned many times, do not hurt the governments they're intended to hurt, they hurt the people. And so they need to be lifted. We also heard that the border between Turkey and Syria needs to be closed so that this pipeline of um, trained groups, terror groups, is blocked and no more of those groups get into Syria. And finally, and this is where we come in as the United States, that the United States needs to stop supporting some of those outside terror groups. All the support for the outside terror groups needs to be withdrawn and allow the Syrians to fend for themselves. The Syrian Arab army is fighting for its life and fighting for the life of Syria. And we need, as a country, to acknowledge our role, what we are doing to cause harm and destruction to the Syrian people, and we need to stop it. And we need to stop it now, and that's why I'm, one of the reasons, um, one of the things I'll be saying over and over again since my return from Syria. Bauman, do you want to say something? No. Okay. Donna wanted to say. Okay. Uh, my name is uh, Donna Nassar. Uh, I have been a human rights and peace activist for as long as I can remember. I'm not going to tell you how many years because then you'll know how old I am. <laughs> um, I, am I was honored to be asked to be part of this delegation. And I am grateful that I had the opportunity to go and see for myself to sit face to face with the Syrian people, to share this time with this delegation so that we can all work together coming back in cooperation to try to bring the message and the truth back to the United States. Um, as an American citizen, it is shameful for me uh, to admit what my government is doing in the sovereign country of Syria. Uh, we have no right to impose these illegal sanctions. In fact, these sanctions, allegedly, the government says, are against the, the, the government of Syria. But in fact, it's against the people, civil society, people who are attempting to maintain uh, the infrastructure, the health care, the safety of all Syrian people. One of the things that um, stood out to me is not only the, the lack of medication and the fact that Syrian children are dying because they can't get chemotherapy meds into the country because of the illegal sanctions that the U.S. and the West has imposed, 
Uh, also, it's, they're not allowing parts and uh, material to get to businesses who are uh, trying to maintain, and they're trying to maintain for more than one reason, and not just to, to, to keep, continue to make money, but to employ people. Because when people have no way to earn a living, they become desperate. And we know that some of the Syrian people who may have chosen to join the terrorists, mostly for economic reasons, because they couldn't earn a living. And their benefactors, the U.S. and all the others who are collaborating together to fund this terrorism, are paying people very well to, main, to, to, to participate in this illegal activity against the Syrian people. So there are so many ways, subtle ways, that the U.S sanctions are affecting the Syrians. And when we spoke to the business people, they mentioned to us, we're desperately trying to stay in business. We're desperately trying to keep our people employed so they don't become desperate and they don't then feel like they have no other choice. Um, something else that's very important is we did have the opportunity to speak with civil society, not just all of the organiz official organizations. And um, we met with people who have witnessed and lived through and shared their experiences with the mercenaries and um, explained unspeakable things. And I'm not going to go into detail about what those were. But it was very difficult to sit in the presence of someone whose child was assassinated, whose, whose niece was kidnapped and is still missing, whose daughter was raped, kidnapped, raped, and then sent back, uh, male and female rapes we heard about. Uh, so um, this is what the U.S. is financing. This is what the U.S. is backing. And this is not okay. And as an American citizen, beyond being a peace and human rights activist, I will not be silent about what I learned. And we have to take responsibility for what's happening in this country and the lack of morality when it comes to our foreign policy and, and what we are doing elsewhere. Um, I do want to say that, you know, we, we did have almost a two-hour meeting with President Assad, um, which we were all very grateful for. Uh, he, um, after listening to him, after listening to all the voices of civil society and the groups and the government officials that we met with, if you think about it, there, it makes no sense what the U.S. media and Western media is reporting. It makes no sense that Assad who is trying to maintain the infrastructure and look toward the future for the Syrian people would be the one destroying hospitals and all of these places that the, the U.S. media and the Western media are claiming that he is the one responsible for destroying. It just doesn't make sense. He is interested in the future for Syria. He told us flat out, you know, when this is over with, we can have another election. If they don't want me, they don't want me. That's fine. But for now, I am the, I have, I've been elected to, to, to lead this country, and that is what I will do. Um, the last piece that I want to talk about is, you know, having been a student and scholar of restorative and transitional justice for many years, I was really very, very impressed and um, excited about the fact that they have a Ministry of Reconciliation that even in the middle of the trauma that the Syrian people are, are uh, involved in at this point, they are looking towards the future and they're dealing with people uh, in a restorative and healing way already. So if someone has joined, the, if some Syrian citizen has joined the mercenaries, they're literally going, and they, if they put down their arms, they are welcomed back into, into Syrian society. And uh, they're fed, and their families are fed, and, and restorative justice techniques are being used so that you don't have a group of Syrians now who are feeling outside of society. So um, everything that I've said, uh, I will continue to say, and I will continue to share with other people. And I feel now that since we have been there, we are now capable of sharing truth that unfortunately our media um, has not been offering the world. And we intend to not be silent from here forward. And thank you all for listening. Joe. Uh, my name is uh, Joe Jameson. I'm a uh, coordinator of the Queen's Peace Council, which is a uh, uh, an affiliate of the or branch of the U.S. Peace Council, and uh, my background is the trade union movement, so I'm accustomed to speaking bluntly. 
so forgive me if I do that. Um, I'm reminded of the, uh, when I'm, I associate myself with all the comments of my colleagues here, but I'm reminded uh, of the famous comment by the American writer Mark Twain, who once said that uh, it's not what we don't know that gets us into trouble. What gets us into trouble is what we think we know for sure that just ain't so. And that's what I think of when I think about my fellow Americans and what they know about Syria and what they think they know about the war and the Syrian government and the Syrian leadership. Uh, what they think they know, I'll argue, just ain't so. And so we have to take that on because we're getting into trouble. Uh, our delegation came to Syria with political views and assumptions, uh, but we were determined to be skeptics and to doubt everything, to meet everyone we could, and to confirm or disconfirm received opinion and establish and conventional wisdom, and to follow the facts wherever they led us. Uh, I concluded a number of things from the trip. I won't go over things that my colleagues have already mentioned. Uh, the motive, in my opinion, of the U.S. war is to destroy an independent Arab secular state. It wants, it's the last secular Arab state standing, and it wants a client regime, like Libya, like Iraq, like a number of other countries you could mention. The U.S. hostility to independent Syria long pre uh, precedes 2011, the beginning of the war. The U.S. I concluded, claims to be against ISIS terrorism, but yet has it's been loath to fight a really consistent fight against terrorism. Certain privileged groups, such as the al-Nusra Front, uh, the names shift, are called moderate rebels because they fight the Syrian government, and the U.S. wants that. They are not moderate. They beheaded a 12-year-old boy when we were there. We saw it on, on uh, YouTube and on uh, TV. The motives of the U.S. proxy war uh, states are somewhat different. Sectarian motives and regional power rivalries affect uh, Saudi Arabia and Qatar. Um, the Wahhabist ideology, the ideology of the Muslim Brotherhood, is a sick, medieval, backward ideology. It drives the Saudi state. It motivates that state to finance this war. and. Damascus, by contrast, promotes a socially inclusive and pluralistic form of Islam. And we met the leaders of that form of Islam, and they are humane and democratic-minded people and have every reason to join with the American people in stopping this insane support for Wahhabism, which is behind so much terrorism in the world. Um, those of, of my fellow countrymen who are dogmatic about Assad demonization are not going to like what I have to say now, which is that the Syrian government is popular, and for that reason, it is winning the war. Uh, the Battle of Aleppo will probably be decided soon, relatively soon, and may be the last hurrah, in my opinion, of the foreign mercenaries. Uh, the, the president is popular. His government is recognized as legitimate by the UN. It contests and wins elections. The elections are monitored. There's a parliament which contains opposition parties. We met them. There is a significant uh, nonviolent opposition uh, which is trying to work constructively for its own social vision. Some of it is inside the government, which in effect is a government of national unity. Some of it is in the parliament. We met them. Uh, the Minister of Reconciliation, as I think some of us have said, uh, deals directly with armed groups, and he's an opposition leader. So let me conclude, which is that the U.S. policy on Syria, regime change, is not wrong in its details. It is wrong in its fundamentals. It is wrong root and branch. It violates the U.N. Charter. It violates international law. The U.S. is bombing parts of Syria without the consent of a legitimate government. That violates international law. The sanctions violate international law. I won't dwell on it because Marilyn and, and uh, Donna have already discussed that. Uh, I think out of our trip uh, flow certain tasks. I think it is the task of the U.S. anti-war movement to unite 
around a different vision than what it has united around thus far. Thus far, it has united around a feeble vision that is partly false, that partly accepts the dominant State Department corporate media narrative. Uh, we must directly and forthrightly challenge U.S. policy if we are to shift U.S. public opinion. Uh, some organizations, alas, buy into the dominant mainstream media narrative. They have not covered themselves in glory by so doing. This is a dangerous moment. Without mentioning names, one of the leading, apparently the leading candidate for president is surrounded by military advisors who are talking about no-fly zones, which means air war against the Syrias, Syrian Air Force and the Russians, or boots on the ground, which means U.S. invasion. Um, if we're not frightened by that talk, we should be frightened by that talk. This is a dangerous moment. We have to change the basic U.S. policy. We need to have a different kind of anti-war movement, and we must begin to shift U.S. public opinion. Thank you. There may be some questions. There may be some questions. Please. Please. Hi, good afternoon, or good morning, rather. Luke Vargas with Talk Media News. A question for Mr. Martyr uh, to begin. Um, you said that the media is giving a one-sided story of Syria, a one-sided presentation. Um, when you are not invited to Syria to look at Damascus, where do you receive your information about what's happening in Syria? To what outlets do you turn? And a question for Mr. Lowendorf. You mentioned that, I believe this is sort of a, partly a quote, but that what you saw in Syria, and rather in the capital, belies the well-orchestrated propaganda about Syria. Um, that would seem a bit like saying you visited middle America because you've seen Manhattan. Um, do, you, do you believe a visit to Homs or Aleppo or other cities around the country would enable you to speak more about the, the situation across the country as a whole? He asked what information, how do you get information when you don't go to Syria? Where do you get information? Well, those of us who are in the peace movement have to read the same press that everybody else reads and tries to determine the issues. I, I just want to add to what I said before. I don't know if, if people realize that for the last eight years, every day, the U.S. has been involved in wars. Every single day of the Obama administration has been devoted to war. And if you compare the media approach, the U.S. State Department approach to Syria, there's a familiarity. It's Noriega, it's Hussein, it's Gaddafi, one after another in order to convince the American people that we have the moral responsibility to intervene. And unfortunately, unfortunately, this institution plays along. Listen, this is not a accidental. This has confused my dear, some of my dearest allies and friends who have said, just like they said about the others, how can you trust them? Without looking at the major issue, what right do we have to intervene in this sovereign responsibility of a people? We're hoping to go back to our friends and allies in the U.S. peace movement and say, we don't have to agree on Assad. We don't have to agree on the government. What we have to agree on is that uh, the sovereign right of a people to determine their own destiny, period. That the media has played a nefarious role 
It's confused. People who have spent their entire lives fighting against war and the struggle for, for peace. Wait a minute. I have, I have to answer his second part, if that's uh, okay. Well, we've waited through 50 minutes of your commentary, and that leaves us 10 minutes to ask questions. So if you really want the media to understand what's going on, you need to hear from the media. But Thank he you. asked he a asked second question. question. So I'm answering his question, okay. if you don't mind. But there are other I'll be people. brief. Okay, yes, good. and then, then we'll take you. So you asked, okay, so we saw, you know, we saw five days, six days of, of Syria. How, how do we know the truth? We only know what we saw, and what we saw goes against everything that we read in the United States. What we do right now, here today, is urge you to stop listening to the, the people that the U.S. government brings out from the Muslim Brotherhood and from ISIS and all the other terrorist organizations. Stop listening to them and go to Syria. The president of Syria said, bring delegations. See for yourself. That's the answer. What we saw is what we're reporting. If you don't, you don't have to trust us, but, but at least accept that there's another picture. And I'll take your, your, your question, please. Uh, yeah, who uh, finances your group? Does the Syrian government give you money to fly to Damascus and travel around Syria? And given that you talked to Bashar al-Assad for two hours, did you bring up the uh, issue of barrel bombing by the Syrian government and its allies, and did you discuss the cessation of hostilities that are supposed to be happening? Um, it's just some of my questions. Thanks. Right. Everyone on the delegation paid his or her own way to Syria. It's uh, twelve to fifteen hundred dollars round trip. The Syrian government. The Syrian government provided us with security and access to all of the people we asked to see and visit, as many as we could. The Syrian government also covered half of our accommodations, and we covered the rest. That's, that's the truth. You can make of that whatever you want. In terms of in terms of meeting with, with uh, President Assad, we did not ask about barrel bombing. Barrel bombing is a term that the United States uses, like scud missiles, a nasty word. What we, what we learned from him and from others is that when the terrorists destroy something, they show pictures and say it's the Assad government. Bombing, no matter who does it, is likely to kill civilians. We know that. They know that. But when an outside force, like the United States and its allies, invade with mercenaries, you expect the consequences that we've seen, which is a lot of loss of life and a lot of people fearing for their lives leaving. Most of the people who leave, however, do not rush to the terrorist side, they rush to the government side. Those people who left the country left for various reasons. In part, they could afford to leave. But most of the people who have left their homes have moved to the government side because that's where they're safe and that's who they trust. Uh, so you're saying barrel bombs do not exist, or this is an invention of the U.S. government? I'm going to ask for this. Man. this that's the term the U.S. government uses. What do you call them? Well, they're bombs. They're Why bombs. do we call them and barrel bombs? Barrels, because they're in barrels, or they're tanks. No, they're not. Okay, what are they in? Uh, you yeah. have a question. Sure, I, just, I, want, I, I guess I wanted to pick up on, you said something about, when you said this institution plays along with it, Mr. Martyr, I think you were referring to the UN, so I just want, and any of you are free to take the question, sort of, what do you think the UN's role in terms of it has a humanitarian presence? It's supposed, I, we don't hear that much about them from sanctions, but when, while you were there, did you have any inter, inter, interaction with the UN presence on the ground? What do you think of the UN's performance? And if any of you saw the, there was an area formula meeting here yesterday, sponsored by the US mission, did, what did you think of that? Uh, I mean, I can imagine, but if anyone wants to, that saw it, what they thought of it, thanks. Madeline, you want to deal with that? Okay. Um, first, on the issue of the United Nations 
on the issue of the United Nations and the United Nations role, one of the members of our delegation, Vanessa Bealey, uh, who is unable to be here, she's still in Damascus, has done a lot of investigative independent reporting on what's gone on in and throughout Syria. And we also heard, so we've heard from her on the role of the United Nations and also from a young man who's um, family is still in one of the villages that's controlled by outside mercenary forces. And he is independently trying to arrange for a food drop into that area because he can't go in to see his family. His family can't come out. But he, is, he has said that the aid is not getting through. And Vanessa Bailey has, Bailey has said that the aid is not getting through. And one of the reasons for that is that it's being intercepted either by the outside mercenary groups or at times we have heard stories that the United Nations aid is not getting through either because it's going to the wrong side, um, to the outside mercenary forces, not to people in uh, the civilians in Syria who deserve and need to have that aid. This is all um, probably independently verified. I don't have the information here at my finger fingertips. But the role of the United Nations hasn't always been um, what it should be in, in, in this particular conflict. And I'll end there. Did you want to add to that? Okay. The only thing I did want to say quickly is that I recommend that we have, there are two independent journalists on the ground in Damascus, um, Vanessa Bealey, B-E-E-L-E-Y, and Ava Bartlett. Mm -hmm. She is, Ava's Canadian, Vanessa is from the UK. And they're still there right now, and they're writing, they're visiting locales, and they're reporting on the ground, talking to people, collecting the voices of Syrians. And um, I, I recommend that you find them. They're both on Facebook, and then you can look up the articles that they've written because they've been published. Thank you. So, um, I just want to mention one thing that was uh, raised by Dr. Jaffrey uh, for us, that the there was an informal meeting of the Security Council, I think uh, some members of the Security Council yesterday, on the question of Syria. And apparently, uh, two doctors from uh, one of these uh, uh, organizations uh, that are affiliated with, uh, with uh, um, Muslim Brotherhood um, are brought in, were brought into the meeting to testify again about the so-called crimes that the Syrian government is committing uh, on the ground. Uh, I was wondering if uh, anybody could pursue this this issue and uh, um, find out what, what the story is, because it seems to me that, again, once again, the propaganda and even military efforts are being uh, intensified uh, after the, the Syrian government almost closed down the, the connections to Aleppo. So we should probably expect more intensified fighting again on the side of the West uh, to recapture the grounds lost. Do you want to speak? I just want to say something about uh, from uh, there's a there's a translation of an interview with a doctor on Tari uh, who lives in Aleppo. He lives in the government controlled part of Aleppo. Most of us weren't aware that. The government actually has most co controls and protects most of Aleppo, and the terrorists have a smaller portion. And we hear only about and from the terrorist-controlled side. But Dr. Antari, there's a, you can find the interview under if you search for Vanessa Bealey and and the interview. But you had a question, please. It, we can't. All right. But maybe if you're if you're available, we're available to speak if you want to continue this discussion.